I'm just wondering if there was some kind of hidden message that would take the offering during free ride. <laughs> I don't know. Um, sometime over the weekend, uh, we had a power surge, I guess, here at Faith Church, and uh, has kind of messed with some of our technology. Um, I was out of town doing a wedding, and so I didn't get back in until this morning. And part of that power surge left me, so I said there's some things missing, so meaning like the end of the sermon, because my computer is like, um, won't even turn on. So bear with us this morning, my sincerest apologies. What's that? Maybe this time. Let's bow forward. Oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. You are our rock and you are our redeemer. Amen. What does it mean to be in love? Great question, I thought to myself as the young groom sat across the desk from me eight years ago. It was during one of our premarital consultations, as I call them, where I meet with couples in their preparation for marriage. Now, these are not interviews where I decide whether to perform their wedding or not as... I'm not going to sit there and decide whether to perform their wedding or not, as many reluctant couples believe that's what's going to happen when they walk through the door the first time. Nor are these ways for me to grill couples on anything from their biblical knowledge to their private life in the bedroom. I don't ask those questions. And I don't want to know. No, these are just consultations to, first of all, plan the wedding, but also help them discover why they're getting married and what it is that they bring to the marriage as individuals. I'll also take the opportunity to walk through conflict resolution with them and help them achieve perfection because aren't all relationships characterized by perfect bliss? Anyway, in asking them, and asking the question to him as to why he was in love with his bride to be, he turned the question on to me. Pastor Brad, what's it mean to be in love? Great question. But wait a second, I'm the one asking the question to you. And he pressed on. He asked it again. Well, I would admit that I was dumbfounded. His question was posed to me during a time when Aaron and I were not on the same page. As Aaron and I have shared openly with you, marriage has not always been easy. In fact, if you remember a few years back, she joined me up here and we gave a message about the brokenness that we had in our marriage over a four-year span and the healing that took place. Oh yeah, we had some crazy times. She threw a perfectly good box of Entenmann donuts at me. <laughs> Not only ruined the donuts, <laughs> but about ended our marriage. Just kidding, sort of. <laughs> you know it's those ones with the chocolate crumb on top? Oh man, those are hard to find. But anyway, I think most of us would agree that falling in love is pretty easy. Now let me ask you this, by a show of hands, how many of you at some point in your life have fallen in love? Just raise your hand. Wow. Now the reason most of your hands went up is because falling in love is easy. Falling in love requires a pulse. If you have a pulse, you all have the required requirements of falling in love. In fact, all of us have fallen in love more than one time in our lives. Some of you, if you were like me, you fell in love when you were five years old with a little redhead girl down the street. Or with Tiffany Spencer in kindergarten. And fall in love with her ended up me getting body slammed by a third grader. Long story another time. Maybe it was a childhood crush. Some of you have fallen in love with people you've never met before. You've fallen in love with Jan Brady or Ginger and Mary Ann. Or that dude on the cover of People magazine. They don't even know your name, but you're okay with that. <laughs> Falling in love is extremely, extremely easy. But perhaps what had this question posed to me, leaving me so dumbfounded, was not that I had, had not fallen in love. I mean, that's easy. It was that staying in love was an entirely different thing. And there I was in that moment, not knowing what was next in my marriage, what did it mean to be in love? Because while falling in love is easy, staying in love is what challenges us in our sense of understanding about love. In fact, I wrote off that young man that day 
in my own inability to answer that question, thinking that this whole idea of being in love was young, is for the young and the shallow. Not for the educated, long-term, married, grinded out kind of folk. But the question lingered in me for some time because at some point in our lives, one of the questions we ask is this. Is it even possible for two people to fall in love and stay in love for a lifetime? Or better yet, for eternity? Now sure, when your relationship began and, and reached that state of commitment, you answered yes to that question. But we start to factor in the dysfunction in our past the brokenness in our past or current relationships, how good or bad your parents' relationship was or is, how our friends', friends relationships may be falling apart and we think that they can survive with the worst, so can I. Then culture certainly gives a whole other vibe as well. Your confidence in this question begins to shake a bit. Can two people fall and stay in love forever? Andy Stanley, pastor of North Point Church in Georgia, a well-known author on relationships, writes this, As daunting a task as it seems, and as unrealistic as it seems, and impractical as it seems, there's something in you and something in me that believes that if you could just find the right person, and if you could just become the right person, and having become the right person, meet the right person, you believe you have the potential to fall in love with someone and stay in love with them forever. And no matter what we hear from others, and regardless of what you've experienced, there's something in you that just won't give up on that hope and that desire. Now our confidence may be shaken, but our hope will not be gone. So perhaps that desire is a reflection of the image of God in us, one that doesn't give up, one that always resides in us, one that values us who, who we are. That it's not enough to have a bunch of drinking buddies. I mean, that's fun, but that doesn't quite get it done, does it? It's not enough to have some girlfriends that you go out with on the weekends. That's fine, but it just doesn't quite get it done. It's fun to reconnect with your fraternity or your sorority brothers and sisters years after you've graduated, but that doesn't quite get it done. There's something in you that wants to believe that there's one special somebody, a soulmate, a life mate, you have to do life, that you get to do life with. There's an intimacy, there's a thing that's so unique, so most unique relationship that, you've, that you would ever have. You want to believe that it's possible for you to enter that relationship like that and for it to last forever. And regardless of what you see and the cynicism in the culture, there's something in you even beyond your woundedness that wants to believe that's possible for you. We're in a theme here called Summer Lovin'. As we move throughout the summer and seek to be renewed and refreshed after this tough winter, a tough winter for people financially, professionally, personally, not just about the weather. But take time this summer to assess who we love, what we love, and how we love. We talked a couple weeks ago about whether we love our church and how that has demonstrated our discipleship. Last week we asked, do you love who you are? This week we look at how we give that love away in the closest of our relationships. Turning to Matthew's gospel, we hear words that sure do not, do not seem family friendly. Now I realize I'm moving into dangerous waters here, but please stay with me. We hear so much about Christian family values, and we assume that we can turn to almost any page of Scripture and find them. We should also be able to find many examples of what a Christian family is like, but if you took, if you took disciple Bible study, you'd know as far from that. I mean, think about it. What biblical family would you choose as your model? Abraham fathered children by two women, Abraham, Hagar, and Sarah. Jacob married Leah and Rachel and also had children by two concubines. David, Israel's greatest king, will hardly do. He was married and so was Bathsheba when he took her for himself and made sure her husband was killed in battle. The man and woman who sing passionate sexual love for each other in Song of Songs weren't even married. One of the most beautiful portraits of love in the Bible is the relationship between David and John. So again, where are we going to find family values? In fact, we know that Jesus said very little about marriage either, but a ton about love. So here are these words from Jesus in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 32 through 39. You might want to grab the handle underneath your seats. You hold on. 
Whoever publicly acknowledges me, acknowledges me, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever publicly disowns me, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against his mother, a daughter-in-law against his mother-in-law. Your enemies will be members of your own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Word of God, the people of God, thanks be to God. How about that? If you take that text at face value, you will be left wondering why a segment of the church focuses so much on family values when you hear Jesus speak quite the opposite. Some scholars have looked at this text for what it is and suggested that Jesus' lack of connection to his own family was justified in his words. On the other hand, since Freud and the development of the counseling movement, we are well attuned to the potential destructiveness of family power and the false self that can generate people, which must be given up if there is to be new life. Family power extends its influence far beyond the psyche. Its unquestioned assumptions govern attitudes, hold values in place, and set patterns that can perpetuate systems of injustice and oppression at both individual and community levels. But we have to look at where this text begins. Everyone who acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. What does that mean? Hear these words spoken another way for the message. Stand up for me against opinion, and I'll stand up before you. I will stand up for you before my Father. See, we're often caught up in, in our daily life. We say our, 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 we say we place our priorities as God, family, work, and youth sports. But in actuality, when you look at your headspace, and you know what I mean by headspace, that which occupies your brain throughout the day, when you look at your time allotment, when you look at your stress level, when you look at how, truly how you live your life, your priorities just shifted, didn't they? Kids' activities, then work, maybe your relationship, and God's probably something down there. All right? The divisiveness in this text is not meant to set you against one another. But it's meant to ask if God is truly the main thing. If you keep the main thing the main thing, then everything else in life fits accordingly. Well, that's a nice little antidote, preacher. What does that mean? Everyone who acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge. Let me phrase it this way. Everyone who puts me first above everything else will come to know how I'm blessed and work through them. He says, I have not come to bring peace to the earth. Indeed, his words here are an indication that the way of the earth. Remember, now Jesus used the word earth here. It tells us something. It didn't say world. It didn't say kingdom. He said earth. Earth means that, that which is our human values in this text. I didn't come to bring peace to your human values. Because that needs shaken up a little bit. Because this is how our priorities have failed us. See, if we're honest, and I hope that we can be, we will acknowledge that our family values are shaped by many memories of our own childhood, happy or tragic. The neighborhood where we grew up, our personal reactions to our relationship or lack of contact with people different than us, our Sunday school lessons, all these things have shaped us and our values. But we can come to know, but what we can come to know is this, that woven throughout the Bible, beginning very early in our creation story in Genesis, and woven throughout every story, old and new, it is this theme of love, sacrificial love that calls us to do and be the same. It was out of love, pure love, the abundance of love that God, that God creates the world, that the world comes into creation. In that abundance, the Creator creates humanity because our Creator was lonely, it says in Genesis 2. And in the stories that will follow up through, all the way to Jesus, we hear how God's outpouring of love was never a noun, but a verb that led God to say, you'll never be alone. That led God to say, I will walk beside you. 
but let God to say, I will I'll be there to hold your hand. Let Jesus to say, I will be there to comfort, to give, to give, to give of myself. And the scripture ends, if you're ready to give of your life, you will truly find it. And it's, it's here where the Apostle Paul leads us in the text in Philippians that was read earlier from, from Roger. Verse 5, he writes, in your relationship with others. In all your relationships with others, he backs up, he says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, any common sharing in the spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit, one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Take that text, apply it to our human relationships. Take that text and apply it to the person you're in love with. If we're going to treat others this way, why don't we start right here at home? Paul gives us a very descriptive account of what it looks like if we are to, to take seriously Jesus' command to love our spouse or to love our fiancé or our partner or to love the one we're in a relationship with. Let me just tell you up front that these are very challenging ideas. And if you find yourself pushing back, that's understandable. That's why you don't find many relationships like this, because on the surface, it just seems to be too self-sacrificial. We don't want to make ourselves so vulnerable. But when you spend time with people who have been together for many, many years and still have that spark, you're like me. I mean, you're thinking, I want some of that. I wasn't even sure that was possible, but that's what I want. I don't want to just have a roommate. I just don't want to have a partner. I want to have that kind of intimacy, that kind of relationship. One of the, 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 the corner turning opportunities for me in the midst of Aaron and I's struggles was back in 2008 when we, had, when we were in Juarez. We had an opportunity to go back and see a house that we had built on our very, our very, very first time we built homes, which was our third trip down there. So it would have been 2004. We went back and, and Four years later, I went to look at the house that we had built. The house was gone. The previous year, a flood wiped the house away. Fine construction here by faith church people, by the way. But a massive flood washed that home away. But there we found Josephine standing in the corner. It was Josephine and Marlo, and they had to be in their late 60s, maybe early 70s. So we built the house for them. And they had once again pulled together this cardboard wooden shack to live in because they didn't have the concrete home that we built them. And I remember standing on the corner and tears coming down my face. And I kept thinking, you know what? That's what I want. It didn't matter what kind of house we lived in. It didn't matter what kind of resources we had. But what mattered was that Aaron and I could be there together. And even if it was a dirt floor, to know that you had one another. When we can begin, we can begin to find that kind of relationship when we hear Jesus' simple words to make love a verb. The way that Jesus has loved us, the way God has poured out God's self for us. And this is what it looks like, Philippians 4, 2, 3. Paul backs up a bit and gives us a little theological slice of this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. The Greek here is this long word, okay? I'm going to pronounce it for you, then you're going to repeat it back to me. You ready? Tap I nof rus une. Yeah, right. Tap I nof rus une. Huge word. And what it means is this to deeply serve from one's moral littleness. What in the world does that mean? To deeply serve from one's moral littleness. Weird way of stating this. I don't want to compete with you. I don't want to state my case and always have to be right in this marriage. You ever heard the comedian go on about, as a man, you can be right or you can be happy? Yeah. Man, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. You can be right or you can be happy in that marriage. But it's more than that. Paul continues, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, each of you to the interests of others. Not just about being right or happy, but truly and genuinely not being so consumed with you. 
Main, keep it the main thing, the main thing, as I said earlier. I mean, we are to be humble. If God, if we put God first, when we put God at the forefront, who God is, it's not this God of ultimate majesty who's beyond our comprehension. It is this God who is very personal, who took the form of Christ, and who became humble and showed us what it meant to live life. See, this whole, this whole winning idea in a relationship, I tell couples this when I do their premarital consultation, you know? You think that stay, that that marriage, that love is all about winning, that you're winning somebody's heart. And you think that staying in love is about winning, but it's not about a victory over another person. It's about humbling oneself, pouring oneself out and helping your partner to win through all things. Mutual submission. See, another often misquoted verse in the Bible that adds fuel to the whole family values discussion is that verse, maybe you've heard it at another wedding, you never hear it at our weddings here. Wives, submit to your husbands. But you kind of had to backtrack a couple of verses because this is what it says. Submit to one another for the Lord's sake. It's about mutual submission. Mutual submission is the game changer in relationships, especially in romantic relationships. Given the culture today of competition, of division, and you know what I'm talking about. All the places that you go, there are people who are angry at each other. If you don't believe me, come out to Little League this afternoon. <laughs> All right? Turn on the TV and watch the political ads. You know what I'm talking about. But this is where, I mean, where else can this text from Paul be successful? I mean, it's when it starts in our homes, it starts in our relationships, and our vital, intimate, personal connections with one another. We have a way to model to the world life-giving, submitting love that wins every time. Love wins when we submit our whole being to one another for the sake of building up. It is the model of God's love for this world that makes us go as a people and establishes a kingdom that's still being built up right here. What happens if I don't have an ending to the sermon? I just keep going. <laughs> so, <laughs> after all these years, 18 years and many, many, many mistakes, and Aaron and I are still discovering what it means to stay alive. And for those of you who are married, you know what I'm talking about. For those who have gone through a divorce, you know what I'm talking about. For those who are seeking a relationship, I think you understand what we're doing. Continue to stay true to who you are and pouring yourself out 100%. Humbling oneself in the way Jesus Christ has taught us. He taught us a way to live and taught us a way to love. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to stand if you would to connect across the aisles. I had another song, but we're out of time because we didn't have an end to the sermon. <laughs> I apologize. Gracious and loving God, here we stand in solidarity with people that we call brothers and sisters. God, continue to unite us. Unite us as a people. Unite us as a community. Help us to be true in our relationships. God, to submit ourselves the way Jesus Christ humbled himself, not for the sake of any glory, but for the sake of building people up. May we come to embrace that in our own relationships and discover what it means to be and to stay in love. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.